So I'm going to talk a little bit about technology and the technology disruptions um, that can be giving way to tablets and smartphones, mobile devices. But more importantly, the user interface is changing. Keyboards and the mouse are giving way to other kinds of interactions. I don't know, for, for this audience, maybe the mouse is an extension of your hand, sort of as it is for me, but for most people, it's a pretty intimidating device, right? So when you come to these new devices, you have voice, you have touch, you have gestures, and why is this important for a country like India, for de developing economies? That's because it can bridge the literacy divide. People who don't understand English, or they, they can't read, they, they could still be able to interact with these devices and do useful things. And now, the other trend that you see is going from landline to mobile phone. Do you remember those days when we had the Bakelite black phones? You know, from there we went to STD operators in the villages and so on, to this world of mobiles. And people are using mobiles for voice communication, they're using it as a camera, they're using it for music, they're using it to send email, to even do payments. And in India, we have 30 million landline phones, but we have 800 million mobile phones. What does this trend mean to us? What does it mean towards governance? Well, I want to take two sort of case studies. One is the Indian railway reservation system. Do you remember the days, you know, you were standing in that line to get that train ticket to whatever, Chennai maybe? And that always happened to be the longest line, the line in which you were. And you couldn't go to the shorter line. Why? Because that, that line was for another destination, right? Until this happened, where we got, you know, private operators who would sell your tickets. You could go online and buy your own ticket. Now you'd be sitting on a train and maybe buy, buying a ticket for the next train, right? All of that is possible today with these technological changes, right? But what's behind this? We'll get to that. The next, the core banking system. <laughs> banking used to be like this. If you wanted to withdraw money, you would go there, get a you know, brass token, and you would sit and wait until you could get your cash. Whereas today, banks look like this. You go to um, someone behind a computer, and you are able to do you know, withdrawals, deposits, transfers, and so on. You have things online. You can do it at the comfort of your home, on an ATM machine, on mobile phones. Things have changed rapidly. So the question is, what is behind this? What are the technology trends that are behind this? And can we use that for better governance, right? Now, here's what I call architecture of good governance. In fact, you could even call it the architecture to reduce corruption, right? Now, the manual process, let's say it was the railway reservation counter. It could apply to city governance. It could apply to state levels and so on. At the manual process, you had a register book and you had a person. That person was almost like a gatekeeper to that information. If you wanted a kata, if you wanted registration done, you had to go through that person. It's locked within the four corners of, uh, four walls of that department or room. So that was cumbersome, and obviously there were long lines, and it was painful to get work done. And next step was computerization, computerized processes, where you put a computer, but you pretty much did exactly the same thing. And frankly, it doesn't improve anything, okay? In fact, the rent-seeking behavior might have gotten a little bit more efficient, right? So in, in this situation, you have gotten some internal processes faster, but you actually haven't moved things uh, far enough. Now, you go to the next step. If you were to take all of this disaggregated data, if there are zonal offices in the railways which all had information only about trains moving from X to Y, but not all the 10,000 trains that the Indian Railways runs, Imagine if all that data were to be moved to a centralized location, right? And you created this data uh, repository. And then, if you were able to actually standardize the processes in which this data would be not only collected, but also used. And on top of that, now, if you were to build devices and technology that people could use at the other end in the field, online reservation, railway reservation counters, could go live because they would connect to the network and they would be able to get you tickets from any point to any point. Earlier, because the book was trapped in a particular uh, railway station or an office, you couldn't buy a ticket from A to B. If you're sitting in Bangalore, you had to buy it only to a certain number of locations within a certain quota. 
Whereas if it's in a centralized system, you could pretty much buy from any place to any place. And that's really what has happened. And now you can next outsource this to private companies, which is tour operator operators who can do the same service because they're connected to the same network. You can go ahead and do this at the comfort of your own home or office. And now you can do this over the mobile as well. So what has happened is when we take disaggregated pieces of information, which are not in standard form, when you put standard layers around it, ensure that it gets aggregated and secured, and then you have different ways to access it, suddenly it opens up improved governance, right? Improved service delivery. What you actually are doing is you're democratizing access. You're allowing your citizenry, private companies, government offices, all of them to access the same data. They can access it anytime, anywhere, with any device. And very importantly, both the creator of the data and the consumer are looking at the same system, right? We'll come back to that. Now, is this a plan, a utopian plan, or do we have what it takes to actually implement this in various departments and ministries and so on? Well, what you need, if you want to aggregate all this data, you need huge data store. The cost of storage has come down. In 1980, a gigabyte of data was about a million dollars. Today, a gigabyte of data is about 10 cents, right? So we can store a lot of information within you know, small spaces with not that much money. Processing power, talking about Aadhaar, Aadhaar does about 350 trillion biometric matches every day. Okay, it's one of the largest uh, such biometric systems in the world, and it's running out of a 5,000 square feet data center. So we can pack a lot of processing power in, a, in small space. Buzzwords you will, use, you will hear are big data and cloud processing, right? It is there today. On the client side, we have these tablets and smartphones, right? Anytime, anywhere devices. And India, it is just spreading like wildfire. People are using mobile phones. My driver has, you know, a greater, nicer phone than I do. And he's absolutely comfortable with it, right? And thirdly, it's not enough if you have data there and people here. You need a network to connect it. And this is where the 800 million mobile consumers make a difference. We have, the telecom operators have just covered the entire country with base stations today, and the network is pretty good. In fact, I keep going to the Bay Area. My, you know, mobile phones work a lot better in Bangalore than in the Bay Area, right? So, the, well, and a lot of other parts in India, too. So we have the network today. We have the client technologies and access, as well as the power to actually aggregate all this information and make use of it uh, for better governance. So what does this architecture actually give you in the form of better service delivery and governance objectives? Both administrators and consumers, uh, and the consumers of that data use the same system. What this means is I don't want the BBMP to sanitize the, um, uh, their financial information and put it out as a budget report. I want them to do receipts and payments as they're doing those transactions for the city, it should collect in a database, in a system, where people are accessing. Of course, they might have a view of the system, maybe aggregate information, but it should come from the same source. It shouldn't be sanitized or modified. It shouldn't go through you know, people in between who transform the data. When you put records in standard form, for instance, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme has one centralized database in Delhi built by the NIC. Every job, every worker's data is out there. Now you can actually make meaningful comparisons between, let's say, how Karnataka is doing versus how Maharashtra is doing in NREGA. As opposed to, if each one of us built our own system, now it's up to interpretation, right? And I'm sure Rukmini is going to talk a lot about that in the education space. Non-discretionary, -dis meaning computers are completely dispassionate. They don't care which community you're from. They don't care you know, the color of your skin or if you slipped money behind the table. This is basically, they will provide services without favor or prejudice. So we need to get into that non-discriminationary mode of service delivery. Transparency. Since we democratize access, that people can all get to the same system, 
Look at, for instance, the right to information. The section four talks about SOMOTO disclosure. This actually, this is what is the implementation of the SOMOTO disclosure. We don't need to go asking people, can you please tell me about this, this, and this? You just go and access that data because they are also putting it in the same store. Accountability. Finally, see when, for instance, uh, in the uh, education space, the Rukmini is going to talk about, when data moves from schools through the, to the DICE system, there's aggregation going on. And you see that there are gaps when it eventually gets to the center. Whereas, if every hop here is completely at the leaf node atomic level being, um, uh, being stored in the same system, you can audit trail every transaction, and they are bound to be accurate. Right? So, and lastly, in some sense, the most important, entitlement portability. The fact that I can't go to a different ration shop, I'm stuck to the same ration shop, gives all the power to the ration shop owner and none to me. Right? If I'm able to go to a different shop, or if, I'm, if a farmer from Bihar moves to Delhi to be a taxi driver and his ration card actually works there, that's entitlement portability. And as a government, I think we need to honor these, these schemes that are out there so that people can move around. 300 million migrant workers moving across the country, whatever their entitlements are, whatever the schemes are, it needs to work across the country. It can't be just in the village that I'm from. So let me talk a little bit about the ADAR project. Um, I was heading the technology team here. And ADAR does only two things. It does enrollments, and then it does authentication, which is after you're enrolled, you check whether you, know, you are who you say you are when you go to the ration shop or the bank or the airport or wherever. Let's take this NRE GA case again. And let's take this fellow uh, farmer, Ram, who is from Madhya Pradesh and what his ordeal is to collect his weekly payment. Ram starts his Thursday morning with a six kilometer walk to the, bank, uh, to the bus stop, and then he takes a, a bus ride about 14 kilometers to the Taluk headquarters. The reason is he doesn't have a bank in his village, and he needs to collect his NREGA payments for the week. It takes about two hours at the bank, and if he doesn't beat the 2.30 deadline, he comes home empty handed. And on that day, he actually got his money. He comes back and pays a money lender at about 5% per month interest. And then he buys some uh, groceries at a Kirana store. Now, what is Ram's cost of this financial distance? The fact that the village doesn't have the bank and it's out there at the Taluk headquarters. Instead of the 792 rupees he had to make that week, he lost that day. The opportunity cost of a, lost a, day, of a wasted day is 132 rupees he lost 28% of his income, right? And how do you solve this? Ram, of course, wants to withdraw cash in his own village, in his own neighborhood, like we all do, right? So what he does now, with the help of Aadhaar, he's able to go to a Kirana shop in his own neighborhood, in his own, around, maybe around close to his house, and this lady who's running the Kirana shop has now a device called the micro ATM. This is nothing but a little small smartphone with a fingerprint scanner. And he enters his mob, uh, other number and you know, puts his fingerprint and say he wants to withdraw some cash. She, uh, she starts this transaction which goes over the mobile network. See, this was not possible about 10 years ago. The mobile networks did not carry, carry data from our villages. Now we do, right? The, the CBS system of the merchant bank is centralized. So it does not, you don't have to go to the branch. It doesn't have to hit the local branch. It goes to the national payment switch, which in turn goes to Aadhaar, and it authenticates Ram to ensure that it is indeed Ram who's withdrawing money from Ram's account, right? And of course, it checks the bank that uh, Ram's banking with, and then the debits and credits happen for 300 rupees, comes back with a success, and Ram gets an SMS if he's got a mobile. And of course, the 300 bucks in cash minus a small commission. Now, what made this happen? What made it happen was the Aadhaar system is aggregated information of all the people in a central database. If we didn't do that, if we said, okay, each state do your own Aadhaar, you can't do this. If Ran moves from his village to another village or moves to another state, things start falling apart. So things have to be centralized to get the power of mobility, right? It's based on standards. That means many people can build apps on top of it using the authentication APIs that have been exposed, right? Now, on the field, on the other hand, standard devices and software choices 
of Kirana and Bank. He can bank with anybody. He can go to any Kirana. He doesn't have to say, oh, this is SBI or this is ICI, ICI and I can only go here. He can go pretty much anywhere like you would on an ATM machine. And there's about two dozen companies which are building these devices. Why? Because it's been standardized. So the prices are coming down, right? And finally, mobility. You know, can, can we do this? Um, uh, so the idea is that even if he goes to Delhi, for instance, and tries to do the same transaction, it will work exactly in the same way. He doesn't have to do it from his own village. Right? Finally, this is a point, a point that Sean brought up, data privacy. For all this to work on this network, we have to ensure that the data is private and secure. That personal identification information is not being compromised. And we have, in fact, done a whole bunch of things to ensure that data is kept private and absolutely secure. We use 2048-bit encryption, which you know, takes about a million years to break if you try to open one of these packets. right? So Aadhaar uses the same sort of architecture of this you know, uh, for better governance as you know, I, I sort of outlined. So finally, in conclusion, so there are significant technology advances that we're seeing, I've just mentioned a couple of them. There's several that are happening that could actually uh, impact us in a hugely positive way if we take advantage of them. We have to aggregate our systems through you know, standards and data and processes. We need to distribute access to everybody. We need to democratize it and ensure that everybody can access these systems. Railways and banking, and now uh, more recently, Aadhaar, is an example of this architecture being used for better governance. Thank you very much.